It's Monday. It's September 23rd. And the word of the day is pebbler, which means somebody who keeps sending memes, links, and videos all the time. Used in the sentence, Eli is a pebbler. And if you encourage him by responding, he becomes bolder. Okay, I bolder. sent you bulldogs, and this is how you thank me, Heath Henry. With, with that me. kind of epic work, but most of us just dream of that, Eli. I'm no illusions. <laughs> I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright, and broadcasting delayed from America's Far Center, we are the Skeptocrats. Oh, this week's episode, Mark Robinson gets caught being Mark Robinson. Donald Trump's stock is checking for remnants of the Titan submersible while it's down there anyway. <laughs> And New York City celebrated happily the day after the debate on September 10th. <laughs> but first, the rest of the intro music. Joining me for headlines tonight are my fellow skeptic rats, no illusions, and Eli Bosnick. Gentlemen, happy equinox. You ready to get autumnal and pumpkin spicy? You know, other people look forward to pumpkin spice. I look forward to being able to record in my studio without intravenous Gatorades. So. Exactly. It's everyone. <laughs> it's everyone's different season. Yeah. Leaves crunching underfoot. Donald Trump <sighs> losing the election to a black woman. It's going to be a great fall, everybody. <laughs> Very excited. Speaking of which, in our lead story tonight, debates are difficult, mm-hmm. especially on the national stage. In the... Human eat dog world of presidential debates. <laughs> we see tons of media attention, but they don't usually matter very much. Presidential debates have historically had very little effect on the eventual outcome of the election. But sometimes, once in a while, a person manages to say things that are so fucking stupid that even undecided voters in swing states look up from their very sticky copy of Atlas Shrugged long enough to think about voting for a lady person with ethno-shifting magical powers. And that's exactly what happened. That's how badly Kamala Harris beat Donald Trump. He lost so bad it ruined the ending of the latest God's Not Dead movie for Christians, people. Yep, it was for brutal. God. Yeah, she beat him so bad that there was talk of having him removed from the ticket and replaced with Joe Biden. <laughs> <laughs> now there's a race. <laughs> so... We talked about the debate on The Scathing Atheist a bit last week, especially regarding the allegations of literal witchcraft by Kamala Harris that led to her very resounding victory. That evil sorcery included Mm fact-checking, secret earphones, knowing the questions ahead of time, and of course, just regular witchcraft, like magic. But mostly, the strategy from Harris consisted of answering a question and then ending her time by saying, shaving a haircut, at which point Donald Trump would blurt out, I'm a Nazi, uncontrollably to finish that. over and over. Or sometimes it was something even crazier. And then he'd spend his entire segment not answering his question and expounding on whatever insane tangent he got tricked into. Yeah, and the weirdest part is the right-wing news knew this was going to happen. Right. They spent the weeks up to the debate going, well, our guy might have a chance unless he gets distracted and goes off like a rambling idiot. That's their guy. Right. And they knew right. it for weeks. Well, and the way she did it, she would just, she would just turn to the fucking camera and go, hey, watch, I'm going to bait him into ranting about Haitians eating dogs. Watch. Insane. It was insane. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll start with the most obvious example of Trump getting lured into a big red X under a giant anvil by Kamala Harris. The topic was immigration, which is one of the best polling topics for Trump and one of the worst for Harris. And during her time, Harris decided to pivot and talk about how Trump's rallies are small and boring and people are constantly leaving early. She said, quote, he talks about fictional characters like Hannibal Lecter. He'll talk about windmills cause cancer. And what you'll also notice is that people start leaving his rallies early out of exhaustion and boredom, end quote. And that led to Trump spending his entire segment angrily sputtering about how his rallies are actually a really good size, calling them, literally, he said, the most incredible rallies in the history of politics. Yep. Yeah. 
Look, he's not going to agree to debate two because he lost so bad. But if he does, she should just bring that ball in a cup on a string and be like, I can do this at the end of all of her answers. And he'll just spend his whole time just <laughs> trying and missing. <laughs> just fucking up a Ken. Uh, almost yeah. got it. No, oh, no, uh, Mr. Anytime, Anyplace, Anywhere suddenly thinks October 23rd is too late and ABC News is too unfriendly a place and anywhere means something different than any place. You stupid <laughs> he shows up wearing earrings. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> so that moment led directly to the first ever discussion at a presidential debate of... Humans eating dogs. Are you sure that's and the first? You you went back through all the other ones and checked. <laughs> I th- I didn't I didn't know of any going in. Okay. I feel like we should check the Romney ones. There's a good chance there's <laughs> no, question. that's a good point. Yeah, there's some dog abuse in one of those. Yeah, while Trump was still on the clock for a segment about immigration, he made the natural segue from his very girthy crowd size to people in Springfield, Ohio stealing cats and dogs that are people's pets and then eating those cats and dogs. This was based on absurd rumors about a community of Haitian immigrants in Springfield that's been thoroughly debunked despite warranting zero amount of debunkitude. And Trump clearly heard it from his running mate, J.D. Vance, who repeated that ridiculous claim during the week before. During a presidential debate on national television trump said exact quote they're eating the dogs the people that came in they're eating the cats they're eating the pets of the people that live there and this is what's happening in our country and it's a shame end quote and that was the most on topic thing he actually said during his answer right and to be clear when jd vance was confronted about lying about that he said well sometimes you gotta lie to win elections Sorry, did I say that part out loud? Did I say that in the response? <laughs> so, I, also, I should note that this whole immigrants are eating our pets bullshit, that goes at least as far back as the 1800s when the same slur was used to pass the nation's first immigration restrictions against Chinese people. So, yes, his racism is as outdated as his economic model. Yeah. Another highlight from the trouncing happened during the topic of abortion. Kamala Harris gave an excellent answer, highlighting the terrifying situations that many pregnant people have already endured at the hands of red states that enacted bans following the Dobbs ruling. And she concluded with one of the most effective lines of the night, saying, quote, one does not have to abandon their faith or deeply held beliefs to agree the government, and Donald Trump certainly, should not be telling a woman what to do with her body, end quote, which is true. The Bible doesn't mention words like mifepristone, despite the ghostwriter being omniscient. It's weird. Mm -hmm. That was followed by a question for Trump about whether he'd veto a bill enacting a federal ban, considering his previous remarks on the topic have shifted approximately every other week this whole year. Trump's answer to that question was pass. (laughs) He (laughs) rejected the premise, saying that Congress wouldn't pass that bill and he doesn't deal in hypotheticals, also known as you know, policy questions during a debate. That's like yeah, kind of hard to do a debate without that. Yeah. Yeah. And just in case his non answer wasn't stupid enough, he managed to work in a claim that babies are being executed after being born. And that's when one of the ABC moderators had to jump in and say murder is illegal in every state. We have to fact check that. That's I ridiculous. like that the ABC moderators took the tactic for fact checking Trump that I take for jokes at a live show that I know Noah has to cut out, right? Just say it fast, <laughs> say it low, leave a little pause at the beginning for the edit. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I th- honestly, in retrospect, I feel like at some point Kamala should have ended one of her answers by saying, also, my name is Susan, just to prove that they would also fact check her if she lied. <laughs> and... That brings us to the topic of healthcare, where Trump managed to make me laugh out loud while I was watching yep. it. He spent a bunch of his time criticizing Obamacare, and then he got a follow-up question asking what his alternative plan would be. In response to, okay, do you have a healthcare plan? He answered, I have concepts of a plan. And to be clear about his concepts, he's going to replace Obamacare if... He finds something that's gooder, faster, and cheaper. Otherwise, 
says he's keeping it. Yeah, big whiteboard in Trump's office that says good ways not to die right now, you know. Just- <laughs> so, well, only because Tyler managed to scribble not in there quick as yeah, Trump no. walked in. But, you know. <laughs> Wrong answers. Okay, so obviously we love talking about Donald Trump's failure, but let's not overlook the very active success of Kamala Harris that night. It was great stuff. It's just less funny and less sexually gratifying than Trump's failure. You uh, know dude, strong saying? disagree, Heath, actually. Strong okay, disagree. Well, a, bit, a bit less sexually gratifying than Trump's failure. They're close, though. So I want to mention one other excellent moment from Harris. In response to Trump doing his best to equate her with Joe Biden, she had a very simple but very effective reply. She said, quote, I'm not Joe Biden. I'm not Donald Trump. What I do offer is a new generation of leadership for our country, end quote. And that single line had one of the best audience reaction metrics of anything from that night. And considering Trump officially refused another debate like a coward on Saturday, that's probably going to remain the best line of the debate season. He claimed that October 23rd for the next debate is too late because a a tiny amount of early voting... (laughs) will already be done. Oh, that must be why he doesn't want to do it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We found it, everybody. The Harris campaign responded by saying, yeah, considering Donald claims that he won the first debate very easily, it's weird he would want to so do it. So weird. It's great. So weird. It's so like yeah, I think team. he's lying. I think he's a liar who's lying. Or he's such a delusional sociopath that he's not technically lying and he actually believes he won. Either way... Everything he ever does or ever says is a perfect segue to a quick break for a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. All right, Mr. Trump, one more time. If she says people leave your rallies early, you say... I personally saw Montel Williams eat a chihuahua. No. No. Sir, it's it's the uh, opposite of that. Hey, did I ever tell you guys about this one yes, time? Yes, when... Sarah, you told us. You told us a lot of times. Hey, 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 TIE Fighter. What's going on, man? You seem uh, snappy today. Yeah, you're wound tighter than a blood larva of Snaglar. What? Snack. That's a great joke. You guys don't get it. Yeah, I, I guess, you know, I've just, I've been kind of stressed lately, guys. Well, why don't you try online therapy through BetterHelp? What's better help? Because they're strangulation worms. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. I don't know, sir. I spent a lot of money on my Tums. I'm not sure I can afford therapy. Well, that's why they have financial aid available. Rediscover your curiosity with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Skeptocrat today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash Skeptocrat. All right, thanks, guys. I'll give it a shot. I feel like with context clues, you could have figured out why that was funny. about the worms, Sarah. You were talking about the worms. Just saying. It's called polite laughter. Read them manners. Okay. We're back. Next up in headlines in It's Pronounced Blase News. We may have finally found a line too far for North Carolina Republicans this week. Cultural appropriation. (laughs) That's right. This week, CNN discovered the posts of Lieutenant Governor Mark Robinson of North Carolina and the Republican nominee for governor, where he defends slavery and identifies himself as a black Nazi. And damn it. That's their word. (laughs) Yeah, small note. I'm going to need news like this to not break the same day as I go see Am I Racist for GAM if the simulation (laughs) wants me to keep playing along, okay? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, but I am looking forward to Mark Robinson's biopic by The Daily Wire called Black Klansman 2. (laughs) So uh, Robinson has denied the posts are his, but um, he's lying and CNN is not. I feel like... I feel like all the news stories I've read on this have sort of couched their language like he might be the one telling the truth. But we didn't end up slightly lower than Joe Rogan on that news media truthiness chart for no reason. So I'm going to go ahead and call my shot and say he's the one fibbing. Yeah, think. Oh, a- apropos, um, if the shit I ever said on the media bias charts message board comes to light, I won't be allowed to be a governor either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And just more generally, 
If you're listening to our comedy podcast right now as your primary source of news, um, I've got a great crypto opportunity available. So just go ahead and shoot me an email. <laughs> okay, all right, but this would be a better primary source of news than Joe fucking Rogan. I was going to say, yeah, we are lower than a lot of... I mean, you know what? I'm not doing this on air. I'm not doing it on air. Did it privately. So the posts in question come from the site Nude Africa, where Robinson identified himself as a perv and a fan of transgender pornography, which, given his stance on trans rights, feels oddly self-sabotaging. It's like if Jeffrey Epstein was caught posting that he hated children. Yeah, the the internet gave him just enough rope to hang himself. Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but he also... I meant both of them. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. But as I was saying, he identifies on those posts as a black Nazi. He defends slavery, and in one of the weirdest long-form posts, fondly recalls peeping on women showering at a public gym at the age of 14, which again from a guy who's been trying to limit trans rights in the name of defending women, it just feels way too on the nose, right? Yeah, well, well, also, but I want to be clear. Anybody paying more than one neuron's worth of attention to Mark Robinson over the last, what, six or seven years or whatever, did not need a confession to know he was a black Nazi. His actions have been screaming Nazi as long as his anonymous porn site posts at least. <laughs> okay, so... Being a Nazi is bad, but here's what what? really bothers me. Stay with me. Here's what really bothers me. (laughs) Who the fuck is in the middle of masturbating at a porn site and also writing a fucking treatise on their politics? That's That's fucking weird. Yes, that's fucking weird. That's insane. Mm -hmm. But the more skeptical... Nazi also bad. Nazi like uh, Nazi's worse. Nazi is worse, but yeah. If we're ranking... Puzzle in a Thunderstorm LLC has no ranking for what's worse, Nazi or porn commenter. You let us know. (laughs) Where does Joe Rogan rank him? I don't know. Exactly. Apparently above us. Uh, But I know, look, the more skeptical among you might be wondering where CNN got their information. Well, I'll let another left-wing rag, the New York Times, tell you. Quote, To verify that Mr. Robinson was the poster behind the comments, CNN identified the username Mini Soldier as one Mr. Robinson used frequently online. In addition to matching biographical details, the report said Mr. Robinson had listed his full name on the Nude Africa site along with an email address that he had used on various websites for decades, end quote. Also worth pointing out that CNN included literal pictures of the profiles with that username and then Mark Robinson using that same username on public accounts. But maybe it's a coincidence. Fair and balanced reporting. There you go. Yeah, well, there you go. I cut to somebody listening to this at the media bias chart office and they're now lowering CNN on their chart. (laughs) Exactly. Thank you. (laughs) And in stock shock news tonight. Imagine you're Donald Trump. I know, reject the premise, but bear with me here. Imagine you're Donald Trump, and you've been looking at this fucking marshmallow now since March of this year, and it's just, it's in this bulletproof see-through box you can't get into, you're staring at it, and it's all delicious and mouth-watering, and there's a timer ticking down until the box opens, and as you're watching it, (laughs) day after day, week after week, month after month, it just gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and now here it is, this tiny shadow of its former (laughs) self when the door finally slides open. And you still can't eat the motherfucker still have it. because oh. you said you wouldn't eat it. And if you try to eat it, it'll get even smaller by the time you get it to your mouth. <laughs> and now imagine instead of marshmallows, it's literal billions of fucking dollars. And that gives you a sense of where Trump's head is now that the lockout clause in his truth social merger has expired and he can finally access the vast meme stock fortune but only theoretically. Not really. Yeah, it's the monetary <laughs> version of when I tell someone I make my full-time living as a comedian, and then they ask me what I do, and I yeah, have to be uh-huh. like, ah. Yeah, and every time you tell someone the answer, we somehow lose 10% on Patreon. Yeah, right. right. metaphor, yeah. 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 Now, regular listeners will be familiar with this story because we have been giddily covering it since way before its inception. If you think about it, the various efforts of right-wing jackoffs to try to make their own Twitter has been even a funnier tragedy than the one about the right-wing jackoff trying to make Twitter his own. 
right? So long before Truth Social merged with the blank check company in March, we've been pointing and laughing at its doomed business model and how stupid any idiot that would invest in it is. And ever since the merger, we've been pointing and laughing at the idiots who pumped the stock's valuation to nearly $80 a share for a company with a net profit of negative $16 million on net revenues of $836,900 last quarter. Oh. That's down 30% year to date, by the way. So sad. <laughs> I would pay good money to sit in on their meetings for that company right. recently. Yes. Just so much money. Just being like, guys, all right, we got to get back to the glory days of losing more like $12 million a quarter like we did last <laughs> oh, year. Oh, sorry. The revenues are down 30% is what I, what I meant to say, too. It's, I'm, like, yeah. I'm sure the, the debt's down on as well. Yeah, guys. It's so bad that interest on shorts of the stock had to be wildly inflated with legal exception, and they still ended up being a better bet than sure the did. stock itself. Sure did. But yeah, so so when the merger happened, there was a lockout clause in place until September 19th of this year that forbade the principal stockholders from selling any of their shares. And of course, Trump selling those shares once that lockout clause expired, or even the broad assumption that he would, would be enough to further tank the stock price. So the Friday before last, with like a week to go until the lockout, Trump put out a public statement assuring people that he wasn't going to sell them, which means that if he did now, it would probably be an SEC violation. Sure would. What do you mean I'm not allowed to lie, Tyler? What kind of business <laughs> does that mean you're not allowed to lie? Of course I'm allowed to lie. It's business, Tyler. Tyler, what do you mean I'm not allowed to lie? I don't know. Maybe, maybe you should start a crypto company with your idiot sons. Yeah. Did you think about that? You're now, allowed to lie a lot in that. Right. So now the reassurance from Trump did raise the value of the stock at the time. In fact, it raised it so quickly that it triggered an SEC mandated five minute pause in trading. Now, this is a stipulation that's been required since 2013 to reduce market volatility. If a single stock's price more, moves more than X percent over a short period, then the stock's like locked up for five minutes. So traders have time to make sure that whatever's driving the shift is real and not the result of an algorithm in a loop or something. But the fact that it's legally required and happens several times a day to all kinds of different stocks didn't stop Trump from declaring it a fucking witch hunt and threatening to take revenge against the Nasdaq. He accused them of, quote, taking orders from the SEC, end quote, which is which is true. I guess the laws are orders, I guess. Um, and then he threatened to move his stock over to the New York Stock Exchange if they did it again. And they did. What? They had to do it again right after that statement, um, to which they said, you know, fucking cry about it, bitch. The New York Stock Exchange also follows SEC rules as it happens. Donald Trump thought that one of the stock markets didn't have laws and that people still choose the one with laws. <laughs> again, it's called cryptocurrency. Yeah, yeah actually, no, yeah, that there, is, the one. there is did, one. Did he not think that the New York Stock Exchange was involved with, you know... Exchange commission stuff, securities and exchanges. <laughs> yes, they get you. It's the same E. Right. Yeah, exactly. They borrowed their letter and everything. Now, lest I leave this story off with talk about his stock rising, I want to emphasize that the lift the stock price off of that announcement was both limited and temporary. It was entirely wiped out within a few days. And as of this weekend, the stock was trading at $13.55 a share. Wah, wah, wah. That's down from a high of $79.38, y'all. And, and it's almost <laughs> certainly going to go lower on Monday because Trump's the only one of the principals that said he wouldn't sell. In fact, the stock is now worth less than it was worth before the fucking merger. Okay, before the merger, the stock was theoretical. Trump's company was literally worth more, and this is true, when it was just the concept of a plan. <laughs> yeah, so if you're, for example, a, uh, a scrappy entrepreneur and you're struggling to make money on your Etsy store or your lemonade stand, just remember that you outperformed Donald Trump by about $4 billion since March. Since yeah. March? Yeah, but $4 billion plus whatever you made. Now, of course, a lot of people have trouble enjoying this story because when all is said and done, Trump still has over a billion dollars worth of stock for what is essentially Eli's blog. Hey! Well, I, I mean in terms of how much work he put into it. Still, hey. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> that is true, uh, but the real victims here 
are Trump's ardent supporters who wiped out their life fucking savings to pump millions of dollars into this worthless stock. And those people can eat so many dicks. Just fuck them and their sure life can. savings. Yep. Also, and think about it. This is the least efficient possible way to give money to him from them, right? They gave him their money in a way that he can't access it, and it's already lost 85% of its value, which is, among other things, probably part of the reason the Harris campaign was able to raise more than three times as much money as him in the month of August. Yeah, and that was before we raised over $80,000 for the Harris Walls campaign with Tom and Cecil in our Humanists for Harris fundraiser over the weekend. And yes, Heath, you can still donate to that by following the link in the show notes. And speaking of how much better we are at financial planning than the other guys, it's time for a word from our other sponsor this week, Trust and Will. The parge of the first parge. What kind of parge? Melania! Melania! Have you seen my grappling gloves? Yeah, they're in the wash from the pigeons. Oh, right, I forgot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, <sighs> no problem. Hey, something the matter? Usually you only sigh like that when your soul escapes your body on Christmas. No, no, it's nothing like that. It's just, with all this Laura Jumer stuff, I have been wondering about the future, do you know? Yeah, tell me about it. Taking care of your loved ones when you're gone can be so overwhelming, we just forget to do it. But that's why there's trust and will. Quas, trust and wig. Trust and will makes creating your will easy, like... Lounging on the couch easy. Their simple, step-by-step -step process guides you from start to finish, one question at a time. Save loved ones time and stress by having all your documents in one place with bank-level encryption. Plus, live customer support is available through phone, chat, and email. Wow, that sounds great. But have you actually tried it? I have. Me and Anna used Trust and Will to set our affairs in order when they first became a sponsor, and it was so easy that I immediately helped my mom use it for herself. That's why I, Eli Bosnick, personally endorse Trust and Will. Wait, who are you? I, I sell Tyler. Uh, you know what? It doesn't matter. I'm, I'm on my way out. Got it. Yeah. Anyway, let Trust and Will uncomplicate the process for you. Protect what matters most in minutes at trustandwill.com slash skeptocrat and get 10% off plus free shipping. That's 10% off and free shipping at trustandwill.com slash skeptocrat. Thanks, Sarah. I feel much better. Hey, you want to go tell Donald we saw Michael Cohen under his bed again? Ja, Sarah. I really do, girl. I really do. Nice. And we're back. Next up in headlines, in RF kayfabe news... <laughs> The life of Robert F. Kennedy Jr. continued being an arc for a WWE heel character and defying satire entirely. Last episode, we talked about some of the latest revelations about his insane life, and since then, it's become even more insane somehow. That includes getting a reporter at New York Magazine put on leave after the revelation that they had some kind of illicit digital relationship, and also it includes... Decapitating a whale. Yep. Yeah. The, the Kennedys, getting head in weird and public ways since 1955. <laughs> they, you know what? The guys running the simulation must have left the password out where their kids could get it. Right? That's the only explanation at this point. <laughs> yeah. Make him decapitate a whale. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a quick recap from the last time around. RFK Jr., as everybody knows, is one of the most prominent anti-vaxxers in the world. He tried running for president as a Democrat. He was told, fuck your face. Then he tried to run as an independent. He was told, fuck your face. He dropped out and endorsed Donald Trump in exchange for a future cabinet position involving national health care if Trump wins. He also spoke to Roseanne Barr about the time he picked up a bear carcass on the side of the road, got distracted by falconry like you do, went to Peter Luger's, ate a steak dinner, and then dumped the dead bear in Central Park, staging it like the bear got killed by a bicycle as a prank on somebody. That was clearly a giant crazy lie to cover the fact that he was drunk driving and killed a bear, yes. very obviously. And of course, he had a giant brain worm removed from his face 
that may or may not be in a romantic relationship with his wife, Cheryl Hines, right now. Yeah. This is a guy who's intimated that vaccines are a worldwide conspiracy to cull the human population. And I get it because his real life is weirder than if that were true. Yeah. Yeah. Also, by the way, an environmentalist endorsing Donald Trump is like that is fucking one's own face. So we should I, I, we should be careful what we ask for next time. Feel like Smart. we got fucking monkey pawed a bit on that one. <laughs> sure. Well, if anybody's walking around with the paw that he hacked off a monkey, it's our. No, figure. that's true. Fair. That's fair. Yep. Yeah. So here's the latest: New York Magazine political reporter Olivia Newsy, which is a pretty awesome name for being a you know news reporter, acknowledged to her editors last week that she had a relationship with RFK Jr. this year during the same time that she was reporting on his campaign. Despite the magazine finding no inaccuracy or evidence of bias in her work, this led to Newsy being placed on leave for violating the magazine's policy about disclosing any conflicts of interest. According to Newsy, the relationship was never physical and only over the phone. In response to the revelation, here's the official statement we got from a representative for Kennedy. Quote, Mr. Kennedy only met Olivia Nuzzi once in his life for an interview she requested, which yielded a hit piece. That's the entire statement, and it very notably contradicts exactly zero amount of the allegation mm -hmm. that he was having some kind of dalliance mm -hmm. despite being married. So very clearly dick pics, right? That's what we're talking about. Yep. Dick pics, or I guess maybe brainworm pics, because oh, you know it would be like hard to tell which is which if it's a close up. You yeah, know what I mean? Sure, obviously. And look, I know a lot has been made about this, but it really was kind of a hit piece, right? Or like honest, right? I'm just wondering how she got from this guy is a dangerous threat to democracy and an idiot to what that thing do. You know yeah. what I'm saying? I want Newsy's <laughs> side of this thing. Right. Well, yeah. And to be fair, there's no way to honestly report about RFK Jr. that isn't a hit piece. Like, Heath is just naming <laughs> yeah. facts in a random just order. Right. And, it's and this a hit feels piece. like a hit yeah, piece. Right. Just listing things. Yeah. yeah. Well, that brings us to the announcement last week that RFK Jr. is under federal investigation by the National Marine Fisheries Service. Already just something's gone terribly wrong. <laughs> right. Yep. <laughs> It doesn't matter what the investigation is. That's a crazy thing to be happening in your life. That's happening for his involvement in chopping the head off a whale with a chainsaw. I'm exaggerating oh. none amount. The probe got launched in response to a 2012 interview between Kennedy and his daughter Kathleen that recently resurfaced after somehow staying under the radar for 12 years. I'd never heard about it until this summer. During the interview, Kathleen tells the story of when she was a kid and her dad heard about a dead whale that washed ashore near where they were at the time. And he was like, I'm going to get that dead whale and chop its head off for my insane nature cabinet that I have. And then he literally did that. He walked out onto the beach, presumably carrying the chainsaw he keeps for this type of situation with him at all times in his weird minivan. And then he spent what, must have been a very awkward, very long time chopping a whale's oh, head off God. while his daughter watched. I think she was six at the time. Oh. Just yelling back at the car, trust me, I had a traumatic experience when I was a kid and I turned out awesome. You're going to be <laughs> fine. <laughs> no. That is how he talks. It is, though. So at that moment, he, he's got the sawed off head of a whale uh -huh. and you don't really think it through, but now you have to carry that so he carries it back <laughs> to his minivan no somehow. no you rotate your side to my left <laughs> jesus <laughs> and then he strapped the giant whale head on the roof of that minivan for the five hour drive oh, back home they were five hours away from home according to kathleen quote every time we accelerated on the highway whale juice would pour into the windows of the car. Why were the windows and down? Went, <laughs> I can't imagine why the windows were down. Thank you. <laughs> and I wake up in the morning and I shower outside and I take a <laughs> Not the time, Dad. Yeah. And it, she continued, it was the rankest thing on the planet. I would imagine a yeah. bunch of whale juice from a dead whale's head pouring into your minivan would smell bad. She continued again. We all had plastic bags 
over our heads with mouth holes cut out. Instead of rolling up the fucking window? I don't, sorry, I don't know. How was any of this possible? <laughs> it really happened according to her account. And she continued one more time. People on the highway were giving us the finger, but that was just normal day-to-day stuff for us. Get people giving you the finger? Wait, what do you mean was? <laughs> <laughs> so, bottom line, RFK Jr. is officially... The most tragic person in the Kennedy family. And that is <laughs> yeah. impressive. That is. Yeah. And in weird science news, the science world held its annual Comedy Central roast of itself last week with the 34th Ig Nobel Prize Awards to celebrate the science that, in the words of its founder, makes people laugh, then think. And since we're here to do at least that first one, we're going to talk about it. First up, this year's Ig Nobel Peace Prize was awarded posthumously to B.F. Skinner, who the more science savvy in our audience will remember for creating the field of behaviorism, which was then applied to all personal computing technology, which in turn is why you are on your phone doing something else while you're listening to this podcast. Yep. And if your science savvy is just cursory enough, you'll just know him from a Shocking animals into submission. Mostly. Yeah, exactly. But don't worry, the prize in question is for a little-known project of Skinner's known as Project Pigeon, where Skinner experimented on the feasibility of using pigeons to guide the flight path of missiles. Well, yeah, once huh. you shock them into submission, you can talk them into anything, it turns out. Okay, <laughs> I want to see how that idea got formed. He's just got like a big chalkboard with his plan for a homing missile, the pigeon lands on it, and he's like, wait a minute. Wait, the pigeon has a note. He's, <laughs> he slowly opens the note into the frame. It says, homing pigeon. Wait a minute. Homing, homing. <laughs> we got this. Exactly. Now, next up, Marjorie. <laughs> then a missile hits the building. Wait a oh, minute. Oh, okay, yeah. All right. Now, next up, Marjolene Willems and her colleagues collected the Ignoble Anatomy Prize for studying whether the hair on the heads of most people in the northern hemisphere swirls in the same direction as the hair of most people in the southern hemisphere in a paper called Genetic Determinism and Hemispheric Influence in Hair Whorl Formation, even though they could have just called it swirlies around the worldy. They, they could have and chose not to. I wonder why. And also, Eli, damn you for not including their results in your notes and making me <laughs> Google all of those headlines that talked about their, quote, hair-raising research, end hey! quote. Yeah. To, to save the listeners the trouble, um, there was more counterclockwise swirling in the Southern Hemisphere, but not enough to draw a causal conclusion. Well, now we can finally give barbers in the Southern Hemisphere the counterclockwise scissors they need. Exactly, why would you do yeah. that? Knowledge for its own sake, Heath. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Next up, Takanori Tankabe and his colleagues took home the physiology prize for their discovery that many mammals are capable of breathing through their anus. In a rather dark twist, the paper was actually motivated by the search for a new way to get oxygen to patients suffering from extreme hypoxia due to conditions like COVID-19, and other breathing disorders, which means in a couple years, intubation might have a very different meaning, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Just a bench of NFL players on the sideline after a big play spread eagles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, no. Exactly, yeah. Our next winter study might be considered a little bit of a life hack, if you're the betting sort. Probability Prize winner Francis Batos, Eric Wagenmakers, Alexandra Safagu, Henrik Goodman, and about 50 colleagues. Oh, I, okay, so if you were going to et al. anyway, why did you wait until after you had to pronounce Serafaglau? You know why, no illusion. <laughs> you know why. Many of them students showed both in theory and by 350,757 experiments that... When you flip a coin, it tends to land on the same side as it started. So, you know, heads up. Well, it doesn't tend to. It's ever so slightly. But but we already knew that because it's on that side half a time more than the other side. You could have also just mathed. You didn't have to do the experiment. <laughs> right. Exactly. This next one is a bit Read of about a Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. God exactly. Damn. Yeah. This next one is a bit of a crossover with our sister show Citation Needed. Uh, for those of you who remember episode 384, where Heath Enright talked about Jeanne Calmet. No. Nope. Well, not all cases. Jeanne Calmont. 
that one. Well, not all cases are as interesting as that one, but some of them might be. Saul Justin Newman won the Ig Nobel Prize for demography for looking into cases just like hers. Newman discovered that many of the people famous for having the longest lives lived in places that had lousy birth and death record keeping. Newman wrote two papers about this. <laughs> Supercentenarians and the oldest old are concentrated into regions with no birth certificates and short lifespans, and supercentenarian and remarkable age records exhibit patterns indicative of clerical errors and pension fraud. <laughs> All right, that is my favorite scientific discovery of the century so far, right there. <laughs> I also noticed that banks tend to fail when you repeal Glass-Steagall and deregulate everything. Very huh. <laughs> interesting. It's all coming together. And last... But certainly not least, Fordyce, Eli, and William E. Peterson were posthumously awarded the biology prize for an experiment they did in the 1940s on how and when cows spill their milk. The duo exploded a paper bag next to a cat that was standing on the back of a cow. And to celebrate their work, the celebration ended with a reenactment involving a toy cat, a human in a cow costume, and five Nobel laureates exploding paper bags. Jesus Christ. So, uh, yeah, big congrats to the world of science. Always funny, sometimes on purpose. Yeah, sometimes. And finally tonight... In Panda Panda News, you got to see it yeah. written out. You remember last year when uh, people in a Chinese zoo thought a Malaysian sun bear was a guy in a bear suit because sun bears are fucking weird? Well, it looks like at least one person's reaction to that story was, wow, that's a great idea. Or at least it sure seems that way after a different Chinese zoo just had to admit that their pandas were actually dogs painted to look like pandas. And yes, of course, we put links to pictures and videos in the show notes. <laughs> and they are worth it. Team Chinese Zoo, y'all. Fucking love this. Yeah, they look pretty amazing. That's fantastic. I want pandas painted like dogs, too. Just right? like all the yeah, different Yeah, just even it out. Yeah. So, okay, so for those of you who are driving or whatever and can't click over to find the pictures. Look I to... while you're driving. It's fine. No, don't it's do that. Fine. Don't, don't do that. Look uh, at it. If... Put it in front of the wheel and sort of look <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> don't do that. That's how um, I read. So I need to emphasize here that these motherfuckers could not more obviously look like dogs painted in panic colors, right? They're just, they're two big fluffy chow chows and they have white paint around their bellies and their faces, except for the eyes and the nose. And if that wasn't enough to tip off zoo goers, they also fucking barked and they begged for treats and they came up for <laughs> snugs and shit. Okay. Every time they barked, you know, someone at the zoo was like, come on, fucking Cut it out. <laughs> Don't do zoomies. They're doing zoomies. <laughs> do zoomies. Yeah, no, pandas do that too. Pandas, pandas do that. Get pandas do that too. Get the zoomies all the time. A lot of hump faster for, than pandas. Yeah, yeah. I would have guessed they were slower. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. As it turns out. Now, for their part, the zoo and Now I want a panda that can do zoom. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. Fun fact. Do you know that there are no recorded deaths of a human by a panda? Well, there you go. Eli, there's a challenge for you. Now, for their part, the zoo and Did you what? think there would be? Why would you not it's be? A it's a panda. It's a bear, though. They don't actually know kung fu. That's just in the movies. I've, now, I've can seen... a panda beat you up if they want to? I'm sure they could. I mean, bear. but they're so nice. They're sweet. They're little pandas. <laughs> so for their part, the zoo insists that they've done nothing wrong because the enclosure was clearly marked as panda dogs. And far less clearly, but still not at the bottom of a stairless basement in a locked filing cabinet behind a door that said, Beware of the leopard. The signage admitted to the ruse. In the first person, as though they were going to try to like shift the blame to the dogs themselves when they got when they got caught, it read, "Quote: We are panda dogs. A pet dog that looks like a panda died and dressed." End quote. <laughs> so the fine print admitted they were lying. It's okay. That's fair. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. No, I'm looking at these pictures, and I kind of think if you thought these were pandas. The sign wasn't going to help. You know right. What I'm yes. These pandas wrote a sign claiming to be dogs. I don't get it. How did they write it? Now, I should note, by the way, that this is not a first for Chinese zoos. It is not even a first for Chinese zoos this year. In May, a zoo in the eastern Jiangsu province was caught trying to pass off two painted dogs as pandas, and they didn't even have the fine print. In 2016, Pet shops in Guangdong got caught selling dogs painted with orange and black stripes as miniature tigers. <laughs> Small tigers. And 
Answers in Genesis got caught selling uh, seals and otters as water dogs. Yep. Everybody's lying all the time. That's God. the key when it comes to dogs. I need to relook at that picture. So it's all. so much fun. It makes me so happy. <laughs> so this is hilarious and stupid and all, but it's also a fucking gold mine, right? Because I feel like everybody who is on this podcast, married to someone on this podcast, or committed to marry someone on this podcast, would go all the fucking way to China for a zoo of dogs painted up like other animals. Of course. Oh, golden Done. retriever tigers, Pomeranian lions, collie <laughs> bears. Oh, my. Maybe they'd even have a fucking pug of pegacorn. I would yes. go there every day of the week, and Anna would make Eli live inside the enclosures. Obvious. There's yeah. money to be made, guys. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm going to book some tickets for all of us. And on that note, we're going to close it out. Thanks to No Illusions. Thanks to Eli Bosnick. Thanks to the dogs and the pandas and everybody involved in all of that. It was amazing. And thanks to all the listeners who liked us and followed us on all the various internets. Please keep doing that. Please keep listening. And please keep telling your friends. And if you find the naive stupidity of our giving away a free show business model to be oddly charming, you can send us gifts of money at patreon.com slash skeptocrat. Just like all the generous new donors, you will be complimented personally next time around. And whether or not you're feeling financially benevolent like those fine people, if you enjoyed our brand of whimsy and you'd like to hear more dick jokes free of charge, check out our brother and sister shows, The Scathing Atheist, God Awful Movies, D&D Minus, and Citation Needed, available in all the podcast places. We just have one last thing. Let's compliment that penis. Special thanks to Ryan Slonick of Evil Giraffes on Mars. He's the creator of the virtuosic musical Stylings You Heard Today, which were used with permission. You should definitely check him out using the links we'll provide or by Googling the only band called Evil Giraffes on Mars. Until next time, catchphrase sign off. Trust and will. <laughs> it's hard to say a lot of things. <laughs> That's fucking Sarah Huckabee. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2024. All rights reserved.